Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's Wound Care Today Facebook Live and launch of our next Microworld module on diabetic foot ulcers. Tonight's session is entitled DFU and Microworld, a new animated way to learn. And our world famous speakers, Dr. Paul Chadwick and Andrew Sharp, are with me now. Good evening, both. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining. Merry Christmas to you both. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, just so you understand the level of their commitment to tonight's event, they're both avid football fans and their teams will be playing live during tonight's session. So if you see any dramatic mood swings, um, you'll know why. Um, as you can see, they're both presenting from home. So if we have any problems with technology, bear with us and we'll have it sorted as soon as possible. The link for your certificate of attendance will be available towards the end of tonight's event and will count towards your revalidation. And the slides and the video will be available on our website, wingcare-today.com, um, for you to access or your colleagues to access after the event. Um, as both speakers will agree, the more involved you are, the better. So please make comments, let us know where you're calling from, but also please ask any questions you have and we'll endeavour to answer as many as possible towards the end of tonight's event. Um, Microworld has been going for just over two years. Um, and now has over 7,000 members from over 40 countries around the world. Um, we have it translated into seven different languages. Um, there are games, there are modules, there are interactive classrooms. So just a massive thank you um, for all of you who've registered over the last two years. And for those who haven't, please feel free to join at mymicworld.online um, and join what is a well, world leading community in wound care education. So a massive thank you. But rather than listen to me, we have a little video that's prepared for you. So over to you, Tim. This is our patient. He seems to be okay and not be in any pain or discomfort, but a closer look shows some external inflammation and what looks like some kind of wound. Our patient has diabetes. So this might be a diabetic foot ulcer, which is going to require assessment and management. But before we move on to that, we need to better understand not only diabetic foot ulcers, but diabetes itself. So let's check back with the team. Fantastic, thank you so much. So before I start, just a big thank you to our partners um, who are Mernlicker. Um, without Mernlicker's commitment, and frankly, bravery to something very new and innovative a few years ago, um, and to their support of independent education, uh, Microworld would not exist and this event would not be happening tonight. So a massive thank you on behalf of me and my team. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker tonight. Over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Ed, and thank you for the kind introduction. As Ed said, my name's Paul Chadwick. I'm a visiting professor at Birmingham City University in the Wound Healing Institute there. And it's great to be having a class number seven on diabetic foot ulcers. So Andrew and I will talk you through this, this you know, for the next half an hour or so, and hopefully you'll have some questions for us. I'm going to really, really focus on yes, diabetes as a condition and how it causes diabetic foot ulcers. And then Andrew's going to go a little bit more into the assessment and management of them. So this reminds me very much the micro world of our old MDT, where I used to work in the NHS a few years ago. And I think I can recognize some of the members within that team and I hope nobody's watching and is, is, is offended. But I think I'm the big purple one, so I don't think it'd be too bad in that sense that uh, they're looking at the foot in without the rest of the team. I think the filler on the right there with the orange is the microbiologist. So when we think about diabetes and and to understand why diabetic foot disease, diabetic foot ulcers occur, occur, it is important to understand the underlying disease process that leads to its development. We know that diabetes is a chronic condition. We know that chronic high glucose levels in the blood known as hyperglycemia contribute to diabetes and diabetes foot complications. But also with that, we have hypertension and other metabolic syndromes that cause damage. So hypertension and hyperglycemia constitute the formation of neuropathy and peripheral arterial disease. So it's the management of the paper's diabetes, but also the other underlying risk factors such as hypertension. So when we think about diabetes, we know the beta cells of the pancreas produce insulin, a hormone which regulates several roles in the body's metabolism. And usually we focus on that and the use and stores glucose and fat and how that manages that and how that portrays itself in the diabetes condition. Many of the blood body cells rely on insulin to take glucose from the blood for energy. And then we think about 
that when we think about going back to your pathology and your early days of biology and we think about the cells and how they're responsible for mitosis and cell division and the mitochondria so if you've got that failure to have energy in those cells then you get a damage to the tissues within inside the cells so damage to the blood vessels and damage to the nerves so with people with diabetes this lack of, of insulin or insulin that's not, not very effective can mean that blood glucose levels rise and a, I just want to caveat that a little bit and put it into sort of more layman terms. I know we've got a professional audience, but basically in type 2 diabetes, the pancreas becomes a little bit flabby and stops producing insulin as, as effectively. And then the cells in the body don't respond to the insulin as effectively, and then they don't start that reduction in blood glucose. So you start to see that elevation of blood glucose. So it's a combination of the reduction in uh, production of insulin and also the responsiveness of the cells to that insulin which creates that elevation of the blood glucose. As I've touched on there are two main types of diabetes type 1 and type 2. 90% of the population that we, we see have, have type 2 diabetes and that usually occurs in the older older population sort of 40 plus and that's caused by where the insulin has, where the pancreas has that flabby appearance if you like so it's producing some insulin which may not be as effective and may not be as much of type 1 usually occurs at a younger age where there's an absolute or no deficiency there's a complete deficiency of insulin production and so people need external sources of insulin to survive so that's where you see people with with uh, insulin injections and pumps and all the modern ways of managing uh, insulin deliveries so if high blood sugars are not controlled over a long time period, you can get damage to blood vessels and you get a reduction in circulation leading to vascular disease. And that's not just in the legs, but into the heart and to the brain. So you get an elevated risk of stroke and heart disease and also foot complications. You can also get problems with nerves. So you get neuropathy. And we think about neuro and nerves and opathy and anything opathy means damage to that area. So nerve being neuropathy being neuropathy, meaning damage to the nerve. So patients get this loss of pain protection, this loss of um, the ability to understand pain sensations. We can also get things, a combination with the, heart, the eyes and retinopathy and kidneys and nephropathy. So you've got this triage, uh, sorry, triad of um, conditions where you get foot, eye and kidney disease. So if people do have kidney disease and got diabetes or do have retinopathy and have diabetes, we should be starting to think about potentially they will have foot problems as well. So you get this foot eye syndrome, it's often um, alluded to in the literature. And as I've touched on, you get heart disease, and heart attack and stroke and foot disease where you get peripheral vascular disease or more commonly peripheral arterial disease and also neuropathy where you get damage to the microcirculation causing a reduction uh, in, in the ability to feel pain and other sensations. So I touched on briefly, there's another animation there. So you get this triad of eye, foot, and kidney. So retinopathy, neuropathy, and nephropathy. Thinking about them as a combination and that combination, that holistic problem with people with diabetes. So how do we define diabetic foot ulcers? If you go through the literature, there's a, a few definitions. National Wound Care Strategy have done a, a really good way of describing what the difference is between a foot ulcer and a leg ulcer and the drawings around that. But really, a diabetic foot ulcer is a break in the skin of the, of the people with diabetes. It can then get deeper and go through the epidermis, into the dermis, and you get deep structure involvement. So you get tendon, um, bone, fascia, and all these things may become involved in the uh, development of the, of the of foot ulceration. So it becomes deeper and wider and can create abscess. And we know that neurological, vascular, and biomechanical factors contribute to DFU. So neuropathy, this loss of pain protection, if we think about pain actually being a gift, um, Paul Brand, who's a very famous person within the neuropathy world, described um, pain as God's greatest gift to mankind. And that loss of pain protection can cause damage unfelt and there cause further people continue to get damaged as they continue to walk on an area that's already damaged. We've touched on vascular insufficiency, this narrowing of the blood vessels, which in diabetes is more aggressive, occurs at a younger age and has a different distribution. And also the changes in foot shape that we might see with neuropathy where you get altered foot mechanics and therefore increasing pressure, which causes the increased risk of foot ulceration as well. Once you have a foot ulceration, you're then at risk of further complications. The most common one is infection, which is categorized as mild, moderate and severe. Mild being around uh, just the surface of the skin and, and two centimeters or less of redness in that area around the um, ulceration. Moderate, where you start to see deep structural involvement with tendon, with bone, or abscess formation. 
or that the redness is spreading beyond that two centimeter mark. And then you get severe infection where you see patients with signs of systemic sepsis. Um, so this is not only putting the foot at risk or the leg at risk, but also putting the patient's life at risk. So we need to think about uh, life and limb when we're people developing infection. The other complication we see uh, less commonly, but it's still a common complication of diabetes is charcoal. Uh, and this is where the bones have gone into um, overdrive in an inflammatory process. So the osteoblastic and osteoclastic uh, cells, which are the bones that lay down new bone uh, cell structures and the ones that resolve and reabsorb new uh, bone structures go a bit wild and have a bit of a party with inside the foot. And you get this change in foot shape as a consequence of this inflammatory process. And as a consequence of the change in this foot shape, you often see this rocker bottom foot, which increases that risk of uh, ulceration and severe foot deformity. So here we have this classic um, foot ulceration there on the, underneath the first metatarsal head. It's so underneath the big toe on the plantar aspect of the foot. You can also see signs of, of damage on the apices of the toes, so on the, on the tips of the toes there, and also some discoloration around the lateral border under the fifth metatarsal head. So you've got a number of small ulcerations in this, and Andrew will talk about how we go about assessing these and managing them uh, later within this uh, presentation. So when we think about foot ulceration and why we, we're so concerned about them, they are one of the most serious complications of diabetes. Um, it's one of the most common reasons, or is the most common reason people with diabetes are admitted into hospital. It can create a considerable burden on the person's family. Healthcare systems, when you think about um, ICSs and you think about how they interact together, it causes massive uh, economic problems within um, health. So we, we, we've been estimated from Marion Kurzweil that about a billion pounds um, is spent annually within England on just diabetic foot disease. And on top of that, we have the social care costs, which um, Graham Bowen has estimated at 14 times that. So 14 billion pounds is estimated to be spent on social care costs. So that's the loss of that person's ability to contribute to society, their benefits, their inability to work, and all these other things that might happen as a consequence of having a foot ulceration or amputation. Around 56% of people with diabetes develop a uh, foot ulceration become infected. And about 20% of these patients with infected wounds go on to have some type of lower extremity amputation. So whether that's a toe, a foot, or a below knee or above knee amputation. And around approximately 18.6 million people are affected with diabetic foot ulcer each year. And we know that you've got a, about a one in four chance of developing a foot ulceration if you have diabetes. So 25% of the population with diabetes will have a foot ulceration in their lifetime. Moving on to uh, assessment, and we talk very much about the rationale for assessment. Um, you know, the main aim is to monitor disease progression, not just the foot disease progression, but also the progression of the diabetes to make sure the patient's not getting further risk factors. The identification of risk factors and risk stratification of the development of DFU. So this is where we're thinking about population health, where we screen patients for uh, elevated risk of developing a foot ulceration. And that gives the opportunity to identify increased risk, stratify that risk, and also educate the patient on their risk and how they can go about helping to prevent their first or subsequent foot ulceration. It helps to diagnose and classify DFU. We've got a number of, of ways of classifying DFU. Anybody who works um, in England within the NHS there will be using the SIMBAD score to complete the National Diabetic Foot Audit. But there's also scores such as Wi-Fi, which are being used quite regularly now for referral pathways. There's also the older methods, such as the Wagner uh, scale, and commonly still used, I think, a lot in Scotland, the Texas scale. So there's various ways of diagnosing and classifying DFU, but it's important that you do undertake some kind of classification. Patient assessment should include patient history, glycemic status, and their overall general health when you're thinking about managing that patient holistically. And finally, and Andrew will go into this in much more detail, we need to consider the neurological, vascular, skin and foot assessment to give that whole picture of the patient. So the whole of the patient and the whole in the foot. The key risk factors for developing a foot ulceration are neuropathy, so that damage to the nerve, that loss of pain protection, uh, a foot deformity, which is where you get that change in foot shape, which often occurs as a consequence of neuropathy, autonomic neuropathy, which causes a dryness in the skin, which can create fissures, and portals of entry for bacteria. Peripheral arterial disease, um, which reduces the blood flow, which causes the tissues to be much more susceptible to damage and then less likely to heal when they have damage. 
And the biggest factor and the biggest risk factor is a previous or history of diabetic foot ulcer. If you've had one foot ulcer, you're likely to get another. And recurrence rate is around 60 to 70% at three years. So people do have one ulcer and then go on to have other ulcerations. So if you've had one, you have very high risk of getting another one. Other risk factors include poor glycemic control. We talked about that at the start, that ongoing uh, high, blood sugar, high blood sugars causing ongoing damage to the tissues, ongoing damage to the circulation and to the nerves. Patient factors such as wearing ill-footing footwear, walking too much, wearing holiday shoes, uh, damage to uh, wearing different shoes on holiday, those kinds of things can always cause problems and increased risk. Skin and nail problems, such as the failure to manage fungal nail infections effectively, or ingrowing toenails effectively. And that impairment of self-detection, we talked very much before about eye problems. So people may not be able to see when changes are happening within the foot. And so they've also got neuropathy, so they can't feel any changes in the foot. So that inability to, to self-detect foot problems is a continuing problem. A history of falls as patients develop different gait as a consequence of their neuropathy. And also people with, as older adults who may have more difficulty in actually seeing the foot, bending to see the foot, and problems with assessing the foot themselves as well. And just the final slide, and just before I hand over to Andrew, and this is where we talk about how we screen people and how we manage population health and how we risk stratify people. I'm not going to go into this great detail, but we see there's, there's really three areas, which is loss of protective sensation, that ability not to feel a monofilament, which is that loss of pain protection. The area of peripheral arterial disease, which is usually detected by the simple palpation of foot pulses, and then whether there's any foot deformity. So adding them together can create that categorization about whether the patient's at low risk, uh, very low risk, low risk, moderate, or high risk. And it also helps you decide how often these patients need to be seen. Just before I go and pass over to Andrew, I would recommend that you do go to the International Working Group guidelines and look at all their guidelines about the management of diabetic foot. Andrew and I have got 30, 35 minutes to talk to you today. There's a, a, an array of guidance there are available on the International Working Group website, and I would advise you to go in, in conjunction with this uh, package of education that we're providing today to support your ongoing uh, development in diabetic foot disease. So without any further ado, I'll hand uh, over to Andrew and he'll take you through how we're going to assess and manage the foot. Thank you, Paul. Uh, and thank you, Ed, for the introduction at the start. My name is Andrew Sharp. Uh, I am a podiatrist working in Salford Care organisation up in the greater Manchester region. Uh, and I'm uh, going to talk to you now then about the, uh, the assessment uh, in a bit more detail. So we start with the neurological assessment and... As we can see here, what we're looking at is for the symptoms of uh, peripheral neuropathy, and it's dependent on the types of nerves that you get damaged. So, depend, uh, there's, there's three, there's essentially three main uh, nerve types uh, within our bodies, uh, particularly in, in the lower limb, and those are sensory, motor, and autonomic nerves. The one we see most commonly affected. Uh, or firstly affected by diabetes is sensory uh, nerves. And that's why we often look to do a sensation test as part of our screening technique, which is using the 10 gram monofilament. So we're talking about the, the type of nerve damage we see in diabetes is, is uh, polyneuropathy, which means across a, a large nerve area and it's uh, peripheral so it's often in in the tips of the toes now they can be in the fingertips as well that people start to notice the problems but as it develops uh, unfortunately motor neuropathy plays its part as well and we can see foot shape changes as a result we might see poorer gait in patients with diabetes and also uh so the autom autonomic nervous system comes into play as well and what we see here is potentially more of a dryness of the skin uh People, as Paul talked about earlier with Charcot, might get poorly regulated blood flow through bones, and that creates this kind of washing effect in the bones, clearing away those osteoblasts and osteoclasts uh, in a very simplistic way of explaining. That's the kind of the way my mind works uh, in kind of a, uh, understanding that that process. So the one piece of kit for, for nerve assessment that really helps us could be the 10 gram monofilament. Failing that, it's a relatively cheap piece of kit, uh, about 15 to 20 pounds last time I looked. Uh, 
we can use a tuning fork, but again, they get to be more expensive, cl closing in on the hundred pound mark for a uh, a calibrated one. But we can just the, the greatest assessment we've got is in our hand, and we can just use our finger. So I, I'd certainly, like Paul has just done, advise you on on other resources. There's the Ipswich Touch Toe Test uh, that we can use to help assess neuropathy, and that uh, resource can be found on Diabetes UK, and it's just about using. A, a kind of approaching a systematic uh, way of assessing the foot uh, just by doing a very light brief touch on people's toes and that could be our first indication we're not necessarily looking at, at uh, diagnosing the severity of neu neuropathy or we just want to ask that question is there a potential of neuropathy here yes or no and if the answer is yes where do we pass people on to and that's always useful to know within our local uh, local area the, the, the other key element then in terms of with the lower limb is we get nerve damage and we get arterial disease uh, occurring concurrently at the same time. Uh, and so we just need to get used to knowing uh, the, the status, the vascular status of our patients. Again, greatest piece of kit is our hand and we just got to get used to feeling the temperature of people's feet, comparing it to the other limb uh, and having a feel for pulses. Be aware that people with loss of sensation and, and, and particularly uh, the, the longer someone's had diabetes, uh, if they've had a history of ulceration, the there's a higher likelihood of, of sensory neuropathy. So where uh, somebody else with full sensation, you or I might have full sensation in our, our feet. If we were to get the early signs of vascular disease, we'd probably start getting pain. This might be absent in, in this patient group. So we're just getting used to feeling pulses as well. If we, Pulse palpation can be uh, really quite uh, simple to do in an assessment and it can tell us quite a lot as well. And, and what we need to be mindful of is, is not being scared to sort of say, actually, I can't feel these pulses. Again, like, like neuropathy, we, we're not looking at, at you diagnosing the severity of, uh, of the diabetic foot and, and its arterial supply. This is more about is there a potential of arterial disease here and should I be referring this person on for further assessment? Any one absent pulse in a person with diabetes gives us the potential that this might have underlying arterial disease and need further intervention. That intervention isn't always surgery. It could be we look at exercise therapy, we look at uh, other methods of control. It might be something that's, I, I was going to say something as simple as stopping smoking, but I realise that's not a simple thing for people to do. So our next step, once we've done our, our, pulse, uh, our pulse palpation, and for those of us who are a, a, a bit more au fait and a bit more skilled uh, in doing, an ankle brachial pressure index can be really helpful. So we know an, uh, a Doppler ABPI is, is really helpful when we've not had an initial ulceration, and it can, it can be quite uh, accurate in, in helping uh, detect arterial disease as we as the disease state of the foot the diabetic foot disease uh, develops or escalates then our abpi can become slightly less reliable on the basis we get a condition called calcification of the arteries which is a hardening of the arteries uh, and and makes the uh, abpi assessment that less reliable and in which case we see hardening of the of the of the microvessels, the, the toe uh, arteries are less commonly affected uh, until sort of really late on in disease state. So a toe pressure can can help us. And the toe pressure can be done. Uh, colleagues around the Northwest and across the country have, have done these challenges within two minutes of doing a toe pressure. So yes, an ABPI can be quite uh, daunting and, and quite time consuming, but it can tell us so much in our, in our story. And as, uh, services develop and you look at getting new kit, I highly recommend toe pressures becoming part and parcel of your practice. Paul mentioned a moment ago about the, the Wi-Fi score, which stands for wound ischemia and foot infection, and that can help give us a correlation figure. Uh, so our millimetres of mercury Doppler toe pressure can correlate to the severity of disease and, and inform us when revascularization might be important or or, or useful in this patient and also what the risk of somebody's amputation is so when we talk about risk in the diabetic foot 
we're thinking about the risk of amputation and the risk of ulceration. So in order to, to know about the risk, we need to also look at a patient's foot and get patients to get used to seeing their own feet as well. That's really important. If they're not able to and they've got carers uh, that you can educate them, fantastic. We need to get used to knowing what they look like. Redness, swelling, with or without pain is are our kind of red flags within the diabetic foot. Uh, and they absolutely warrant immediate referral. The, the list of what these type of problems can be is uh, they're all potentially severe. Sometimes, hopefully it's not, but the quicker we act and the quicker we respond to these problems, the better. It could be something like an infection, a charcoal state, uh, something else like a DVT or something going on that we need to get assessed quickly. These are, these are time important assessments. So it's really imperative as well, wherever you work across the country, to know how you get the rapid access. One of the greatest things uh, patients can have is, is the knowledge of knowing who to call and when to call. Uh, and that can, that's really kind of at the key of, of diabetic foot ulcer prevention is knowing when and who to access. So when we look at the assessment of the actual ulcerated foot now, so the skin's broken down, we have a diabetic foot ulcer, as Paul, Paul defined a moment ago. Often uh, there is an underlying disease state here alongside it. We see either neuropathy or ischemia or a combination of both. More and more, I think we see in a combination of both in these patients. Uh, and now we can start to use classification systems. So we the, the SIMBAD score is, is, is a binary system that we use. It scores ones and zeros, depending where it is. And I won't go into to too much detail about that. Uh, if, you, if your uh, service is involved in the National Diabetic Foot Audit, this is something they'll be using. Uh, and I'd highly recommend just having a quick Google search of the SIMBAD uh, classification system. Because what it can tell us is actually by giving us a score out of six is the likely of, or the severity of the diabetic foot. Uh, with our kind of our key one, really the one that has the the greatest uh, weighting on 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 severity is the ischemia check. So the vascular assessment is one of the key key concepts uh, in diabetic foot assessment. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when we look at the signs of the neuropathic foot, we're looking out, like I say, for sensor motor and autonomic neuropathy. Our sensory neuropathy is when we start to lo lose our light touch vibrations perceptions usually the one to follow we might look at temperature pain and loss of protective sensation and depending on your services you may well do a combination of all of these uh, nerve assessments or often it's the kind of the screening one to be done is the 10 gram monofilament and in absence of a 10 gram monofilament like i say it's which touch toe test on diabetes uk can be really informative we see foot we see motor neuropathy causing foot shape changes. If you remember from the picture Paul showed us uh, a moment ago, we saw tips of toes with, with uh, lesions on them, callousy type lesions. And often we get this retracted toe occurring where people are weight bearing on areas that aren't designed to weight bear. Uh, and, and these can become quite easily ulcerated. We should have nice straight toes with a fatty pad, uh, pulpy bit underneath taking the pressure for us. As autonomic neuropathy develops, we, we see a dryness in skin, cracking of skin, and uh, easier formation of callus. And this is often why we recommend people use a regular uh, moisturizer in the feet. And in doing in creaming the feet, we kind of combat that that dryness uh, element. But we also get used to knowing what our feet look and feel like, uh, so we can spot early signs of problems. So what are our signs of arterial disease then? We've talked, so ischemia and peripheral arterial disease can be terms used in, in texts that are kind of interchangeable. Ischemia, uh, and, and all these sit under an umbrella term of, of uh, potentially of chronic limb threatening and ischemia as well in terms of if we've got an active foot ulceration, it's not healed within a sort of two or three week period, uh, then then we, we're kind of moving into this this. Uh, world of chronic limb threatening ischemia and that's where our wi-fi score really helps us if we if we're looking for other additional signs because we don't want to just do one one assessment in in isolation we can look for some uh probably what i would would class as kind of softer signs but they, they can be quite helpful if you're used to knowing what the foot looks like we might see a dryness of the skin thinness of the skin 
start to see some hair loss, uh, colour change, it becomes pale. It's a cooler foot, especially in comparison to the other. And also typically we'll, we'll it, it, sort of in text, we'll talk about turning up on, on areas that aren't necessarily areas you'd expect ulceration. So we, we, we tend to see ulceration in the diabetic foot on the on the bottom of the foot, sole of the foot. Uh, if we start to get side of the foot, top of the foot, that tends to, to indicate there might be some uh, ischemia, arterial disease involvement, especially when we start to get necrotic tissue. Uh, we get kind of these punched out wound edges that some people uh, refer to. Uh, I mean, it, in practice, nothing is ever this cut and dry. There's this combinations in neuropathy and, and it's complicated with ischemia. But the, if we get used to the kind of the hallmark uh, kind of terminology, then it, it helps us in our uh, eye assessment as well as our, our hands-on assessment. We see them often in the peripheries as well, as, as it suggests, peripheral arterial disease. And, and toes become black, ne necrosed, and, and potentially gangrene can affect these people relatively quickly and easily alongside infection. So if we talk about the actual management of diabetic foot, diabetic foot is, is to my mind, quite a relatively uh, straightforward uh area to think about in terms of, of what needs managing and there's five key areas really we need and and this applies outside of the diabetic foot really to all foot ulcerations we look we need to offload the foot if it's in an area of pressure we need to make sure the patient's got good metabolic control we we understand where they are on that uh, continuum of, in, of infection and if you look at the iwii guidelines uh and i've forgotten what that stands for my apologies uh, International Wound Infection Institute. Uh, and we go from a colonization right the way through to, as Paul described, the severe infection that, that takes us into hospital. It's understanding where we're up to uh, uh, and what wound care, uh, wound management we can do there. The ischemia we've talked about, uh, if people haven't got a good blood supply to the area, then doesn't matter what we throw at it. it it's never really going to do uh, as well as we'd hope. And then the local wound management, which covers debridement and the dressing choices, uh, which often is the bit we jump straight to. But we need to think about all areas and all elements that, that come into this. So offloading in our diabetic foot patients, if they've got a, a, what's what I deem as a classic diabetic foot problem, it's on the bottom of the, uh, the ball of the foot. Uh, and it would respond really well to uh, complete offloading being a, a non-removable uh, offloading device such as a total contact cast or a non-removable uh, walker boot. Uh, There's this products out there such as Vacal Paired Air Cast, etc. You've possibly all seen them when uh, footballers have broken metatarsals, etc. Uh, and these will reduce pressure and promote wound healing. The, the, the non-removable bit is kind of what can really help it in the fact that if patients can mess and, and can take it off, they will. And then with the best will in the world, we've taken it off and we just need the loo. Uh, we're up on our feet before we know it and we've not put our boot back on. So if, it, if it's irremovable, we're getting complete pressure control. It's quite impactful on life. It, it, you're wearing it in bed, you're wearing it in the shower. Uh, it, it can have a real impact, but it can make a real difference for our patients. And, and unfortunately, it's not used potentially uh, as much as it could be. I think in the literature... It's around about 15, 10 to 15% of patients with a diabetic foot in this area will have a, a, a non-removable device in place. So then we need to think about if, if what we want is up here and what the patient uh, wants is somewhere down here, we might have to meet in the middle. So it's not it's not a non-removable device. So it's something removable. Uh, it's got to fit into the day-to-day. -day. Patients have lives outside of coming seeing us, believe it or not. Uh, and we need to think about other methods of offloading. So it could be, we, we use insoles, we use uh, orthotic devices uh, such as uh, post-op sandals, uh, there's, there's products out there where you can remove pegs from areas, walker boots, custom-made footwear can quite often be used. It could even get something where you kind of, you're really coming down to the patient level and it's something that just gives a bit of pressure relief, tip of a toe, a silicon device that just gives that pressure relief uh, for that patient that you know could be better but you, you've, you've got to work with your patient groups to, to kind of bring them on board 
but the quicker we offload it, the better we offload it, the, the, the better the rate, especially in the neuropathic foot. So a key element, as Paul's talked about, is the metabolic control as well. Uh, individuals with a diabetic foot ulcer uh, are going to be more at risk of developing infection. Uh, we get a kind of a, a sugar-rich blood, and, and, and that's the type of thing that bacteria will go uh, nuts for. And uh, something that would start off as quite a, a mild infection is, before you know it, within 24, 48 hours, spreading and life-threatening and uh it, it can really get quite messy quite quickly. So close monitoring of the blood, working with diabetes specialist teams uh, where appropriate, trying to hit that target control of, of I'm going to say 6.5% because that's still how I remember it. Uh, my mind is slowly coming across to the, to the new methods of 48 millimoles per mole. People, if you think as well, often we're <clears throat> reducing people's activity levels we we potentially increase in their risk of hyperglycemia. Sorry, excuse me. <coughs> the presence of the wound, uh, especially in infection, can lead to poor glycemic control. Sorry, just bear me one second, guys. I just need to cough. Sorry about that. Uh, so yes, yeah, so the metabolic control becomes part of part of the problem, and it because it, it increases our risk of infection. The usual signs of infection of redness and pain, heat and swelling can be absent in our patient group. Uh, so we definitely need some vigilance with this. Early management of diabetic foot will reduce risk of hospitalization. So the better we do at, uh, at spotting this, the, uh, uh, I mean, sepsis is, is one of the things that's making national news now. Uh, and if we think that the diabetic foot is at risk of infection, and the spread can be quick and, and relatively silent, then this is something we need to, to be on. And that's why when we talk about that red hot swollen foot, with or without pain, then we do need to be reactive with that. So points for you guys to take away is really that the the, the mild diabetic foot infection, uh, where we're just talking about the local skin tissues, can be ma managed with oral treatments as well as top treatments uh, but as it starts to spread into to moderate and severe this is not something that that you want to manage in isolation none of it is something you want to manage in isolation but absolutely when we start to to develop the infection we need to think about escalating these patients in and in in, in certainly in the severe infection this might be the person you just send to a and e uh, because 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 time is is a uh, time is tissue as they often refer to but but time is life as well with this so with our perfusion uh, and, our, uh, and ischemia assessment, as we've talked about, we're looking at the palpation of pulses, looking out for some of the symptoms as well in terms of claudication, ischemic rest pain. So if somebody is active, uh, nine times out of 10, if someone's active and they're not getting any intermittent claudication, the chances are that nighttime cramping that's occasional isn't ischemic rest pain. Ischemic rest pain is something that you can often see on people's faces. It, it, it it's debilitating. It keeps them up at night time and awake, hanging a leg out of bed or sleeping in a chair. Uh, and that is that is pretty much at the end stage of the disease state. So these people need to be seen if they haven't already relatively quickly uh, to, to get the right treatment, to get them out of pain. Ulcerations that aren't healing, uh, especially within a normal kind of time frame that you would expect in other types of ulcers, and especially when we start to get necrosis and absolutely when we get gangrene. Gangrene could have been triggered by the infection, uh, but this, this, there's been some level of uh, vascular damage there to, to lead to that. We see two main types of, uh, of ischemia. We get this acute stage that can happen to any of us where we get a blockage uh, within the arteries and we talk about the six Ps, the cardinal signs. Uh, and, and if you're not aware of acute limit, Limb ischemia signs have a have a look at that but what we see more commonly in the diabetic foot is this chronic limb threatening ischemia where, where it's kind of a slow burn and and the, the circulation just gets worse and worse with time often it can be stabilized but uh, we can then get what is sometimes termed acute on chronic where a blockage occurs in somebody who's had this level of ischemia for quite a long time and what we need there is our tissue perfusion assessments of pulse palpation and Dopplers. But actually, we need to start finding out where the disease is and, and refer people for, 
for duplex or MRI, uh, con CT angiograms, MRI and digital subtraction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This needs uh, this needs the vascular service to take over and start to have a look at, at the extent of damage now, because revascularization is going to be uh, a key component in in helping this heal. So. Our local wound management bit really is, as we talked about, it's about assessing the wound and you can use, uh, there's two key acronyms I know out there. There's the TIMES one uh, that's been around for a number of years, which has sort of evolved over time to now be moist, uh, which incorporates oxygen saturation to the wound bed and considers uh, the the kind of the new technologies that are out there, like your uh, topical oxygen sprays, your negative pressures, your... Uh, um, MMP inhibitors, etc. Uh, so, if, if you're using times that that does seem to have escalated uh, more recently into moist, and I believe there was a, a webinar through Wound Care today with with Matt Malone where he talked about that uh, a couple of months back. Uh, anyway, sorry, I, I, I digress slightly. The local wound management is about recognizing what goes on in the wound bed, uh, wound bed preparation. We need to think about our types of debridement. If debridement is indicated, we're not necessarily going to uh, debride everything aggressively. We might be cautious and we might wait for further assessments. We've got sharp, autolytic, uh, mechanical. There's many different ways of debriding the wounds now. And we need to ask that question of, of is this reducing by a, a 50%? Often patients will ask me, when will this heal? And, and, and I'll, I'll use this back to them and say, listen, if I can see a 50% reduction, over four weeks, and I know we're going in the right direction. Uh, and, and until that time, really, it's how long's a piece of string. They often forget to ask me if it's reduced by four, uh, 50% over four weeks, so it does buy me some time as well. So really, overall, the, the risk of developing a diabetic foot is minimised by uh, by doing the right things, looking after our, our glucose, uh, blood pressure, cholesterol. Uh, regular foot checks will, will help us know our risk. Uh, going to our screenings will, will help inform when we get and where we get uh, uh, the uh, assessments when we need it rapidly and making sure people wear footwear it's not something we often like to look at but, but literally looking inside people's shoes can be can can be very uh, indicative to, to a problem our management focuses on them five key areas uh, diabetic foot ulcers should not be managed in isolation. You absolutely need a multidisciplinary team around you. I've, I've been 20 years in the game now, and uh, Paul's been a couple of more than that. Uh, and I don't think either of us would, would feel confident in, in managing diabetic foot in an isolated uh, environment without the support of an MDT. So uh, uh, absolutely, the being a recognising the part of the team and recognising the patients, the centre of this team as well, to, to, uh, to be involved because... Uh, we can take we can we can try and get them on a journey with us, but if they're not engaged, then we're going to struggle. So that's me done, guys, and I'm going to hand you back over to Ed now. Thank you very much, Ed, and thanks for giving me the chance to wrap it on there. <laughs> thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Paul, um, and thank you, guys out there. There were so many comments, um, so many questions. So um, first and foremost. Um, We'd love you to come and join the community. So head over to online. I'm going to crack on with the questions, Andrew, Paul, if that's okay with you, because we've got quite a few, and I want to try and do this in an hour so that people can get on with their evenings. Um, so question number one, which you were just covering, actually. Um, within my team, whose responsibility is treatment of the diabetic foot? I tell Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, do you want me to take? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it's it's essentially everybody's responsibility. I suppose the you need to find out uh, where your MDT is in terms of they will be the named uh, responsibility for this. Uh, it, it, it's a difficult thing to manage in primary care or community care. Uh, it, it's often the consultant specialties, whether that's non-medical consultants or, or medical consultants that take the lead. Uh, so... I would say oh, overarching the management of diabetic foot should be the MDT. Uh, it might be a, at a local level you are involved on a on a week to week, day to day or week to week basis uh, to support that. But but in essence, it's the multidisciplinary foot care services that that head this up. Yeah. 
just to add to that in terms of the sort of broader perspective, I agree that the multidisciplinary team is that sort of pinnacle, if you like, of the, of the management when patients have got active problems and limb threatening problems. And, and really, you've got this sort of a whole system that should be built around that MDT where you've got community podiatry and the foot protection team supporting them, taking early referrals, managing patients with identified complications. So people who've got, um, you know, neuropathy or got peripheral arterial disease and require some kind of input, whether that's footwear advice, education, um, ongoing maintenance of any any foot complications, calluses or ingrowing toenails. And then wider than that, you've got the wider sort of general practice role there where people are, are identifying the risk factors and you've got your practice nurses and your GPs and your, your healthcare assistants in general practice doing the identification, but also managing the disease and managing that, hopefully that prevention of the patient developing those complications that, that lead to uh, ulceration, neuropathy and arterial disease and all those kind of things. And Andrew touched on it really well in the sense that the patient is the centre of this. And we know that the resources within the NHS and broader in terms of the number of podiatrists out there and the number of people who can manage these conditions, we need to get the patient activated and sort of responsible for their own health in some ways and making them feel that they have their own responsibility to maintain their diabetes control, checking the feet regularly and all those kinds of things. So it becomes a very much a team approach based with the patient at the centre of that and across the whole health economy. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so question two, Paul, why don't we start with you on question two. Um, is it important that district nurses have access to and are trained to undertake a TBI or is it best, best to refer them on? I think, I, I don't want to make this profession specific. I think you, you have what available and what skills and abilities you have in each particular area um, a TBPI is is, is useful. Um, as as Andrew touched on within his presentation, it's it's really comes into its own when we're thinking about a patient with a foot ulceration, uh, where we're trying to assess that the potential for healing with that with that with that foot ulceration, where potentially an ABPI is less reliable because of the things that Andrew talked about in terms of vascular calcification. So if you've got that patient with a TB uh, who's got a foot ulceration, you'd hope that they'd be a part of a multidisciplinary team, and whether that wider service involves district nurses undertaking some kind of vascular triage or podiatrists undertaking vascular assessments, then uh, it's important. So I think access to an identification for the need for toe pressure to be done is the most important thing for a district nurse or any practitioner. And having unfettered access and referral to somebody who can do that safely and competently is also important rather than actually the individual, whether it's a particular service, as long as it's available somewhere in the area. Yeah, could, could I add to that then, please? Uh, so this is a QI project we're currently looking at within Salford, where where we, we're training our tissue viability nurses and district nurses to uh, to do toe pressure. So hopefully coming to a a wound care conference in the in the not too distant future, we might be able to show these types of uh, uh, data set to show. Uh, the, I mean, nurses are, are it's a it is really straightforward. Uh, process to do i'd say absolutely easier than an abpi i i would much prefer to do a toe pressure than an abpi uh, just because it, it 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 can tell us so much in such a quick space of time uh, but yeah to reiterate what paul said absolutely uh, this this is kind of the best piece of kit when it comes to diabetic foot ulcer assessment and i wouldn't necessarily expect a uh, the, the district nursing team per se to be doing that but but if you if your service develops and you can bring that on board it will absolutely be a, a kind of a, a string in your bow to to help move your service forward fantastic thank you so andrew back to you question three what is the most accurate way of measuring a wound to identify if it is reduced in size by 50 percent that's a good question <laughs> that's a good question uh i mean there's digital technologies coming in i know they aren't the mainstream at the moment i tend to just uh, go for the uh, uh 12 to 6 9 to 3 kind of uh, clock face or, or, or document which way my clock has turned if i'm doing and do it kind of perpendicular across it there isn't a hard and fast way uh, to say that that is the most accurate way uh like i say the the digital technology is what will make this uh, more effective and more reliable. But I think if you've got a team you're fairly confident are all measuring in a similar similar fashion, then you at least know your measurements uh, are going in the right direction. And when we start to see the wound area reduction, uh, whichever way we measure it, if we multiply one figure by the other and give us a, an overall figure and we can 
start to calculate the differences, then we, we start to understand how much it's reducing. It, it's great to know it's the 50% bit, but uh, the accuracy in it, we accept this, this kind of bit of variation within it. That's why I think when you're getting to fifty percent, you are seeing a significant difference, however you measure it. Brilliant, thank you. And yeah. just to add to that, I think I think Andrew made the point there very, very well at the end is the fact we should be measuring, and we should be measuring that fifty percent because we know that if the wound doesn't reduce in fifty percent at four weeks, that it's not going to go on to heal at twelve weeks. So it's a good mark of yeah. healing at four weeks. So the fact how you do that assessment and how you do that measuring is is is, is different in different organizations and I'm, I'm involved in a, a significant project about how digital technologies will help with that and how how ai will help with that moving forward in terms of measuring not just area but also volume so that's a piece of work that's coming um but r really we need to make sure that people are measuring rooms and are thinking about that four week window and thinking actually this is only reduced in 10 percent or it's got bigger we need to do something different with this wound we need to think about changing our debridement changing our offloading maybe even consideration for ad adjunctive therapies such as topical oxygen therapy to start to kickstart that wound that's clearly not in a healing trajectory brilliant thank you um so next question can neuropathy cause skin changes elsewhere other than the foot thank you joy for that question um, yeah, I mean, diabetes per se can cause a, a number of skin um, complications. Um, the most common one or the most talked about, which is di certainly diabetes related, is uh, necrobiosis lipodica, which is a, a condition of, of, of skin damage, usually in the shins uh, that you see this, uh, the, the necrobiosis. You can also get spontaneous blistering as a consequence of neuropathy. So the skin tissues become more damaged and more easily so when you get that superficial shearing effect, you tend to get more damage, more you get damaged more easily than you do with normal skin who haven't got neuropathy. You commonly get that in the hands, but most commonly in the feet. And then you can get a general dryness of the skin as a consequence of the change in, in of, of, um, of, of skin perfusion as a consequence of neuropathy. You can also get a change where you get um, laying down of the of the a glycosylation of the tissues as well, which can cause an alteration in the, in the hands and the, and the shape of the hands. So as Andrew touched on, the neuropathy we see is distal symmetrical polyneuropathy is the common one we see. So it usually affects the distal areas and it's on both sides. So, but, so you know, we normally talk about feet, but you can get in the hands up to the elbows as well. So one of the reasons we ask people to assess using sort of another part of the body other than the hands when he's going for neuropathy is the fact that they may have neuropathy in the hands. So Andrew, I don't know if you've got any other particular ones that... Uh, no, I'm glad you started that with all those big words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean... The other the other thing you you quite commonly see is, is the link to venous disease and venous eczema and, and dryness as a result, which isn't directly related to, to diabetes in itself. But yeah, you, you absolutely can see it elsewhere. But uh, yeah, glad you fielded that one, Paul. <laughs> uh, um, next question, Andrew, for you um, on the same theme uh, from Andrew. So thank you. Can other neuropathic conditions aside from diabetes also lead to trauma wounds to the foot that may be hard to heal? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, uh, I mean, th they'll play a part in, in pressure ulcer development if somebody's uh, in a bed. If uh, if somebody's developing venous disease, uh, I mean, our, our main, main types of, of lower limb ulceration of venous pressure and, and, and diabetic uh, foot related in terms of neuropathy and, and, and arterial disease in of, it, so in of itself, with or without diabetes. Uh, and, and when we get in neuropathy, it can, it can mask the early signs and symptoms of, of the problem. Uh, and then the autonomic element can can contribute to that over time. I, I, I hope that's answered the question, but it's, it's a good question and, and probably what I need to think about a little more to give you a more succinct yeah. answer, really. But yeah, just I'll, I'll add, on, add on to that, Andrew. I think there's, I mean, neuropathy itself um, can be caused by a number of other conditions. It's just, just that we commonly see it in diabetes in, in, the, in the developing world. So, but if you go to uh, sub-Saharan uh, areas, you'll see some leprosy and see damage and tissues for that. Commonly, you may see in the, in the UK, particularly, maybe more so in certain parts of the UK, probably Manchester, where <laughs> from you see, you see alcoholic related neuropathy uh, a little bit as well so you see that damage as people who've got 
and um, loss of nerve function as a consequence of, over, of, of abuse of alcohol. So they're the common ones, but you can get things like pernicious anemias and, and things like that that cause sort of some kinds of neuropathy, which can, of any kind of neuropathy, you've got that loss of pain protection. It, it puts you at increased risk of undetected trauma, which then can cause future damage to the tissues. Brilliant, thank you. Um, next question actually is for me. Um, my quad looks great. Thank you. Do you have any more modules coming in the future? Um, the answer is yes. Um, I'm well aware of this because the team's working on them already. So for next year, we've got in order uh, venous leg ulcers. We've then got burns. And then we've got debridement, which takes us up to nine. So I think we started wound healing, exudate management, infection control. We did, we did something on moist pressure injuries, um, incisional care, diabetic foot, and then the next three. So by the end of next year, there'll be nine modules there. So, and they're available for you, your colleagues um, to get involved. Um, and actually from, from our point of view, we've had specialists around the world engage with the education. We also use it to train um, everyday practitioners all around the world, but also more and more having patients and their carers getting involved as well. So um, I think there's something for everyone on the site. Um, so next question, I don't know about moist. Where can I get more information on this? Um, shall, I, shall I start with that, guys? So from my point of view, one, go to Microworld because there's a whole module on it. Um, also, uh, Mernica have some fantastic education on their website. There's an amazing academy there. There's just loads going on. So if you Google Mernica and moist, you'll be taken in not just the stuff on moist, but other stuff as well. Guys, your thoughts on moist and where, where best to look? Yeah, there's a, the, the original paper came from the Austrian-German um, wound care um, group and Joachim Dissermond wrote the paper. So if you look up Joachim Dissermond, I think it was a 2017 paper on moist and why it's used. And and I think there's a, a review paper coming out soon. Uh, I know well, I know there's a review paper out because I'm one of the co-authors on it. So uh, <laughs> so there will be a new paper coming out soon on the on the on the role of moist in the management. I think the advantage of moist for me is it brings in that element of oxygen management and and the role of perfusion within oxygen management. And, and we have time, which has, has been used in the past, but I think moist gives an extra dimension to help people when they're faced with a foot wound or a venous leg ulcer or any kind of pressure wound. So um, as you've said, Mernica and Moist are probably the way, way to go in the first instance. But I actually think about the original paper was done from the from the wound centres of Germany and Austria. Yeah, well, absolutely. It's, it's, it, it, it's out there in the, in the mainstream, aside from being industry sponsored. I think Mernica just recognised the, uh, the the kind of the utility to clinical practice. And, and Paul likes the oxygen bit. I really enjoy the, the additional bit in terms of advanced therapies when we can use things earlier, I, I think is often a question we get asked. Uh, and I think most helps with that, that kind of thought process. So guys, that was our last question. I'm well aware it's, we've got two minutes to go. So, I mean, first of all, thank you to you two. I'm massively appreciated. Um, so for thank you for having us. The, and there's been huge numbers actually. So um, I'll share with you the numbers at the end. Um, your link, to the certificate of attendance is available. So download that now for your evaluation. A massive thank you to your joining. From a microworld point of view, go to mymicworld.online. There's loads going on. Um, thank you if you've already done it. Um, please join if you haven't and let us know your thoughts on um, what's good, what's bad, what else you'd like to see in the future. Um, if you'd like to come and meet us in person, come to Wound Care today um, on the 6th and 7th of March in Milton Keynes. The microworld team will be there. The Monica team will be there. The Wound Care today and get animated team will be there. So we'd love to see you at Wound Care today. So just a massive thank you um, to you two again. Um, a big thank you to um, the incredible teams at Mole and Wound Care today, and also Get Animated, um, who've done all the animation that you guys love. I think they're the best in class. Um, to Monica, our partners, again, thank you for your trust and support. But most importantly, to you guys out there, um, you continue to inspire. Um, please stay safe, stay strong and have a very Merry Christmas. Thank you very much. Thank you.